Welcome back everyone to Blackthorn Prod. I'm Noah and this is episode 2 of a small tutorial series focused on iOS and Android game development using Unity and C Sharp. Our goal throughout this series is to make a simple game called Tiny Planets. You must simply stop cute planets from colliding with each other by dragging them apart with your fingers. In the first episode, we set up our Unity project. In this one, we will actually program the game's core mechanics. But just before that though, here's a big thank you and shout out to Game Dev Markets, the sponsor of this video. This is an awesome website filled to the brim with epic assets you can use in your game projects. They have top-notch quality sprites and animations, juicy fonts and 3D models. I was especially interested in sound effects, and oh boy does Game Dev Market deliver with a massive collection of amazing sounds. I bought this giant game sound collection with over 3,600 sound effects at about $30. But note that Game Dev Market also has many excellent free assets. With that said, my brother Liam will take over from here and bring you through the process of programming this iOS slash Android game, Tiny Planets. Hey guys, this is Liam, so let's get started. The first step that we will take is to make the planets randomly move around the map. So how this is going to work is that each planet will select a random position on the map. It will slowly move towards that position and once it has reached, the destination, it will find a new random place to move towards, and so on. So let's create a new C-sharp script called Random Patrol that will take care of this functionality for us. Once it has been created, I will select all my planets in my scene and I will drag and drop the script onto them. Now let's double click on the script to open it up. In here, we are going to need 4 public float variables which will contain the boundaries of our map. So I will create a min x, max x, min y and max y variables. Basically in Unity, we will just select one of our planets and move it to the far left edge of the map. We will then look at the position on the x axis of the planet. We will copy that value and paste it inside of the min x variable. The far right corner from the map will let you fill in the max x. The top edge will let you fill in the max y and finally the bottom edge will let you fill in the min y variable. Now that we have these four variables, we will be able to successfully calculate a random position for our planets that are within the boundaries of our map. Let's start off by creating a function that will return a vector2 and we will call it getRandomPosition. To create a random position, we just need to generate a random number for the x position between our min x and max x variables and a random number for the y position between our min y and max y variables. Once we have stored those two random numbers, we will simply return a new vector2 with the x coordinate being our random x variable and the y coordinate being our random y variable. Let's now create a vector2 variable called target position. Inside of the start function, we will set this variable to be equal to our getRandomPosition function. So, at the start of the game, each of our planets will calculate a random position on our map and they will store it inside of the target position variable. Then, in the update function, we will simply check if our current vector2 transform position is not equal to the target position. If this is the case, so we will slowly move towards the target position by saying transform.position is equal to vector2.move towards. The first parameter that we have to pass in is the current position, so I'll just type in transform.position. The second parameter is where you want to move towards to, so I'll put in our target position. And finally, the third parameter is how fast we want to move. So I'll quickly go up and create a public float variable called speed, and I'll pass that variable as the third parameter. Of course, we'll multiply our speed variable with time.delta time just to make sure our game is frame rate independent. Then we'll make a else statement, so basically if our current position is equal to the target position. If this is the case, then we simply want to calculate a new random position, so I'll just set target position equal to our get random position function. Let's now save our script and go back to Unity. Before pressing play, let's just make sure we have put a value for our speed variable, so I'll type in something like 0.75. If we now press play, we will see that our planets are now moving around the scene randomly. Perfect. Okay, we now want to code out the functionality that will enable us to drag and drop our planets so that we can avoid them crashing into each other. Let's create a new C-sharp script called drag and drop. Once it has been created, let's add it to all our planets. 
As we're at it, let's also add a circle collider 2D and a rigid body 2D component to our planets so that we will be able to detect collisions between them later on. I'll set the collider to trigger and I'll set the rigid body to kinematic to make our planets unaffected by external forces such as gravity. Let's also create a new tag called planets. Once you create the tag, select all the planets and assign that tag to them. Okay, now that we've done that little bit of setup, let's open up our drag and drop script. We're only going to need two variables in the script. The first one is a bool variable called move allowed. This variable will contain true or false depending if we are allowed to move this planet. The second variable we'll create is a collider 2D variable called call. In the start function, we'll set the call variable to be equal to the collider 2D component that is attached to our planet. Okay, so now inside of the update function, the first thing that we want to do is to check if we have any fingers touching our screen. This is super simple thanks to the input.touchCount variable. This variable will be equal to 0 if nothing is touching the screen, it will be equal to 1 if there's only one finger touching the screen, 2 if there are two fingers, and so on. So in our case, we just want to check if input.touchCount is greater than 0. In other words, if we are touching our screen. Once we know that we are touching our screen, we want to store that touch inside of a variable. To do so, we will create a touch variable called touch, and we'll set it equal to input.getTouch. Inside of the parentheses, we need to specify the index of the touch we are trying to access. So if I pass in 0, it will return the first touch, if I pass in 1, it will return the second touch, and so on. We'll pass in 0 to get the first touch, and that's the only touch we're going to store because we don't really care about the other ones in our game. The reason we only want to store the first touch is because we only want to let the players move the planets one at a time using only one finger. Alright, so once we have stored our first touch inside of a variable, we want to now know the position in the world where that touch took place. To do so, we'll create a vector2 variable called touch position, and we can simply use our touch variable and say dot position. There's one little problem with this line, and that is that touch dot position returns the position of the touch in screen space, basically in pixel coordinates. But we want our position to be in world space, which basically means in Unity coordinates. Thankfully, Unity has made it super simple to convert pixel coordinates into Unity coordinates thanks to the camera.main.screen2world point function, and then we'll just pass in our touch.position inside of the parentheses of that function. We now know exactly the position in the world of where we touched. Let's now create three different if statements that will check for the different phases of our touch. So the first one will check if the touch.face is equal to touchface.began, so basically when we just touch the screen for the first time. The second if statement will check if touch.phase is equal to touchphase.moved, in other words, as long as our finger is still on the screen. And the third one will check if touch.phase is equal to touchphase.ended, which basically means when we take our finger off the screen. Okay, so inside of the first if statement, we want to create a collider 2D variable called touchcollider, and we'll set it equal to physics2d.overlappPoints, and inside the parentheses, we'll pass in our touch position variable. This line will store the Collider 2D component of whatever we touch on. Then we will create an if statement checking if our call variable is equal to the touch collider variable. If this is the case, we know that what we touched was the planet who has this script attached to it. Once we know this, we will set the moved allowed variable to true. Then instead of the second if statement, we will check if move allowed is equal to true. We will set the planet transform.position to be equal to a new vector 2 with the coordinates being touchposition.x and touchposition.y. And finally, once we remove our finger from the screen, we'll reset move allows to be equal to false. And there we go, that's all we need to do to make this work. Before we test this out, let's hop back into the random pixel script and let's detect if two planets collide with each other and reload the scene if they do. To do so, I'll start off by importing the Unity Engine.scene management's namespace. Then I'll create a void on trigger enter 2D function. Inside of it, I'll check if collision.tag is equal to planet. In other words, if what we hit had the tag of planet. If this is the case, then we want to simply reload the scene. To do so, we can use this handy little line of code. Okay, so now let's save our script, go back to Unity and press play. Let's also open up Unity Remote 5 on our device and connect it to your computer using the charging cable. If you followed everything correctly, you should be able to drag and drop the plants around. Awesome work, everybody. You might notice that the game is a little unresponsive and laggy. This is completely normal and it's not because we did anything wrong in our code. 
It's just because Unity Remote 5 is just a quick way of testing our game. Once you properly build your game and launch it on the App Store or Play Store, your game will run very smoothly, so don't worry about this, guys. Alright, anyway, I'll pass the mic back to Noah. Alright, Noah here. We've made some great progress in this video. In episode 3, we will add a main menu to our game, a simple loose screen, as well as put into place a cool increasing difficulty system. In the meantime, if you want more great tutorials from me and my brother, consider checking out our Game Dev Unity courses on Udemy. Okay, thanks so much for watching, and an extra big thank you to Blackthorn Prod's patrons for supporting this channel financially every month. Stay tuned, cheers!